Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to your daily dose of scripture news and commentary. Today is April 26, 2024, and happy Friday to all of my viewers today. I opened up the week uh, talking about the Unity Box and how it's created by a lack of prophetic ministry. Um, the church has largely become a nonprofit entity, and that's a play on words, of course, and I mean a nonprofit. P-R-O-P-H-E-T. It's a nonprofit entity. And uh, the prophetic in, in many ways is really kind of shunned within the church. Um, it's just opted for evangelism these days. Well, without that prophetic vision for our nation and our time, because things, things are different here in America than they are around the world, and we're coming into a time period that we've never seen before, Without that prophetic vision, what you're going to develop within the church is a set of norms that might just be out of sync with where God is going for our nation, specifically our nation and our time. Well, then what happens is, is that when prophetic ministry comes along and it sees something that other churches don't see, and it reveals a different direction or a different dynamic that needs to be engaged, well, then that ministry is viewed as being divisive because it's not walking in unity with the mainstream church. You see, the church develops this, and I, I don't know if they do it consciously or unconsciously, I think it's unconsciously, but they develop the unity box. Everybody has to function within that unity box, and then prophetic ministry oftentimes functions outside of the unity box. And so that's kind of the dynamic that I started out talking about on Monday, and I didn't really intend to spend the whole week talking about it, but well, here we are, Friday. That's what we've done. So I wanted to end the week by, by at least addressing one thing that does fit within the unity box. This is some good news for everybody. And, and it's found in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3. See, Paul writing to the Ephesian church says this. He says, we need to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. You see, we're all different. All, all ministries are different. And were to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Now, see, the unity of the Spirit is needed for when we don't see eye to eye. And somebody might ask the question, well, how long are we to maintain the unity of the Spirit? Well, the answer is found down in verse 13. We're to maintain the unity of the Spirit until we all come into the unity of the faith. Now, what that tells me is, is that at some point we're all going to believe the same things. See, there's, there's a unity of the Spirit. I'll, I'll just I'll rewind here. Unity of the Spirit in verse 3. And we're to keep the unity of the Spirit because we're all one body until we all come into the unity of the faith. That's mentioned in verse 13. So there's different levels of unity, different types of unity. And we're to maintain the unity of the Spirit right now. Now, we are going to believe all the same things. There, there's going to come a time when all believers are going to believe alike. Now, a lot of people think that that's inconceivable, that that would happen here on earth. There's no way that that would happen on God's green earth. Well, that's not the case because the Bible tells us of a time when we're going to have the unity of the faith. Let me show it to you over in Isaiah chapter 52. We'll go to Isaiah 52 and verse 8 here. Listen to what it says in verse 8 of Isaiah 52. It says, Thy watchman shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye. And when do we see eye to eye? It says, When the Lord shall bring again Zion. So, so here's what that shows me. If you read this in context of the larger prophecies that are taking place in Isaiah, this is talking about when the Lord restores us after we've been judged. The fires of judgment are going to get us all to realize who we are in Scripture. We disagree on that right now. I'm, I know what I'm convinced of. I know that there are other people that are, that are convinced of other things. But, but the fires of judgment are going to produce... Uh, a uniform belief. We're all going to see eye to eye and we're going to see who we are in scripture. We're going to understand and see perfectly what just happened. It's still ahead of us, but then we'll see what just happened 
And, and then what comes next? When does that happen? When the Lord starts to restore Zion, our nation. So that's post-judgment during the time of restoration. So that's when we're going to see eye to eye. That's when we come into the unity of the faith. So we keep the unity of the Spirit until then, until we come into the unity of the faith post-judgment. Now, speaking of judgment, there are those who believe that we can pray away judgment. You know, somebody would say, well, stay on 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 7. It's a favorite quoted in the church today. It says that if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. And so a lot of people, you know, use this verse and they will, they say, well, see, Stan, if the church prays hard enough, because it says we're supposed to pray there, if, if we seek God's face hard enough, then revival is going to come and God is going to heal our land, right? Um, well, no. And I'll tell you why no. And, and there's a yes in here too. It's, so it's a kind of a no and a yes, but, but I'll tell you why no, first of all. You see, this verse pertains to the entirety of the nation. It doesn't just pertain to the church. My people here, this is, this is Solomon. That's, 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 uh, the Lord is revealing this to Solomon, and Solomon has just dedicated the temple in Israel. Israel is God's people. What the Lord is showing Solomon is that if my people, that being Israel, the entire culture, the entire nation, if the entire nation turns to me and prays and seeks my face and turns from their wicked ways, their national sins, then God will hear from heaven and forgive our sin and heal our land, that being the nation. So, so, so bear in mind that my people here is all of the tribes of Israel. And we're trying today to get the church to fulfill this when it's only something that the nation can do. The entire nation is going to have to cry out to God. It's not just the church, because I, I, I believe today that there's a lot of churches that are crying out today for God to heal our land. And the church is praying. The church is seeking God's face. The, the church is, is trying to live righteously before God and turn from its wicked ways. Well, so then why isn't God healing our land? Because this is not a verse directed to the church. This is a verse that's directed to the entirety of of the nation. And so the church can't fulfill this. The nation has to do this. The entire nation is going to have to pray and seek God's face. Now, there's a scripture that corresponds with this. I know I'm hitting you with a lot of scriptures here today, but it's found over in Joel chapter 2 and verse 17. Um, when, when God brings judgment against this land, it's going to get so desperate for us that it says that the priests in verse 16, let's back up to verse 16, it says the priests are going to gather the people and sanctify the congregation, and they're going to call for a, a solemn assembly and a fast. And the priests and the ministers of the Lord are going to weep between the porch and the altar, and they're going to pray, and they're going to cry out, and they're going to say, Lord, spare your people. Don't give your heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? See, we're coming to a point when we're going to be overrun by Gog and Magog. And when that happens, it's going to look like we're done. And we're going to, as a nation, we're going to have to cry out to God according to this verse. And, and when we do, we're going to have to say, Lord, spare your heritage. Lord, there's the, the, the lights are going to click. We're going to realize that we're the people of God. We're going to start to see eye to eye then. We're going to start to come into the unity of the faith then. And we're going to realize that we're God's people and we're going to cry out to God and we're going to say, God, don't let us exist under the rule of heathen people. Lord, we now realize that we're your people. We don't want to be under them. Well, then it says in verse 18, then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. That's when God removes the northern army, as you read further down in Joel chapter 2. When does that happen? It's when the entire nation comes under judgment. It's when the entire nation cries out to God. You see, then God will hear, then God will heal our land, and that's when revival comes. It's not just when the church is praying for revival. It's when the whole nation is crying out to God for his intervention in our state of affairs. You see Joel chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, that's the fulfillment of 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. If my people, 
who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. That's the fulfillment right there on your screen. You see, that's when we can reclaim society and wrap it up the way that God wants for America. But it's not going to come before then. It's going, to be, it's going to have to be the whole nation crying out to God. So with that, I just want to just take a few minutes here before I wrap up and just do some vision casting. The, the Christian church today is on the precipice of days that we have never before experienced. And I, I mean never. We're, we're coming into the final period when Jesus is going to confirm his covenant with us as a nation. Well, you see, the church did not exist when, when Jesus did that with Judah during his earthly ministry, during the first three and a half years of that seven-year cycle where he confirms the covenant, according to Daniel 9. Well, he's done that for three and a half years. We're coming into the last three and a half years when he's going to do that. The Christian church did not experience that when he did that with Judah. The Christian church has not experienced what God is about to do with a nation, with the United States of America. It, it has never lived through what we're about to see next in the United States. And so I don't think that the Christian church really understands the prophetic shift that is going to occur at the close of the dispensation. We understand 2,000 years of dispensational history, and we're busying ourselves trying to replicate where God has been, but we're really not occupied with where God's going because we don't have that prophetic vision Okay, so, so the church is largely looking at a historical model, trying to replicate the historical model, but we haven't yet stepped into that prophetic model with our vision to understand where God is going fully. Now, you know, if you've been watching these videos for any length of time, you know that we're starting a church in Fort Collins, Heritage Ministries. Well, I want Heritage Ministries to be different because we're beginning with the end in mind. We're not trying to replicate the infancy of the church. We're, we're, we want to be the church that is plug-and-play compatible for where God is going within our nation in the days that are just around the corner. So we're not trying to replicate what other churches are doing. We have our eye on where God is going, where America is going, and that's not where most churches are going today. We're, we're, in some ways, we're outside of the unity box. Well, you see, as a pastor, priority number one for me is, is this. It's not a mega church with mega ministries and lights and smoke machines and all that kind of stuff. Okay, cool. Awesome. But that's not my number one goal. Priority number one for me is just, it's simply this. It's to have a body of believers that are moved by scripture, not by their preferences. Activism today within a church, it's, it's a big thing in the Christian community. It's a big thing in Christian circles today. You've got a lot of churches and a lot of Christian activists. They're, they're frantically saying, well, we've got to get involved. We've got to unify. We've got to do things to turn America around. We've, we've got to build parallel economies. We've got to build parallel systems. We've got to do all this kind of stuff to reclaim America and to make sure that we, we survive in the coming days. Well, you see, all of that emphasis comes from the belief that we're going to build our way out of the situation that we're in. When in fact, friends, God's going to have to cleanse us out of our situation. We're not going to build our way out of the situation. God's going to have to cleanse us out of our situation. He's going to have to bring the judgment that gets rid of all the garbage. See, the liberation is going to come through destruction. The, the very thing that we want to avoid, that being judgment, that's the very thing that's going to save us. Now, I admit, I have a bias for action. I have a bias for building things. I, I wrote an entire book. It's called Rules for Rebuilders. My brother and I co-authored it. And it's, it's about the rebuilding process. But, but you see, we've got to understand that if now is the season to tear down, not to build and to plant, if, if, we, if I as a pastor have to resort to activism with people who will not be moved by God's word and embrace God's model... It's a waste of my time and theirs because I'm just simply placating them to keep them coming to the church. And all of a sudden, that's, what, that's, that's why the church would, would exist. 
It's to placate people and their preferences for how they want to reclaim society. Well, friends, that's not why the church exists. The church has to start doing more than affirming people's bias. And, and people need to assimilate God's word first. And then they need to be active second. I want you to get that. People need to assimilate God's word first and then be active second. Why do I point that out? Well, because today that's largely inverted. People are being active second. They're assimilating their preferences and then they're putting God's word second. Sometimes they reject God's word outright because they don't like what it, they don't like what it says and the process that God's going to take us through. And so it's not about what you think that needs to happen. It's about what God says it's happening. Just imagine a church that is, that is so shaped by the word of God that, you know, nobody gets sick. I mentioned this either earlier in the week or maybe it was last week in a video. Imagine a, work, a church that is so fully assimilated the word of God and they understand that sickness is part of the curse, that they've learned how to conquer and defeat that, and the people just don't get sick in the church. Would you, would you rather go to a church like that and be a part of that, or do you just want a bunch of programs and activities and a bowling league? I know which one I want. I want a church. I want to be around people that are shaped exclusively by the word of God first, and then they're active second. Why is that? Well, I don't want our church to be caught with its pants down, so to speak. Believe me, churches that lack prophetic vision and direction are going to be in for a very, very rude awakening soon, and they won't understand the events as they unfold around them. They, they, you won't be able to adjust to God's judgment on society tomorrow if you're wanting a group hug, hug with society today. You've got to start to make that shift today. So it all comes down to this as we wrap up Friday. We cannot afford to remain in the unity box with, with other ministries if, if they're off track with their vision. We've got to be not just evangelistic, we've got to be prophetic. We've got to let the prophetic guide our evangelism. All right, well, that's it for the week and for the day. I want to close with the word of the Lord for America, and here's what it is. America, you are the house of Israel in scripture. You are my people, and America is my nation. You are my Zion, a city set upon a hill, a light to the world. I have separated you from other people, and you are mine. Return to me, and I will return to you. Repent, and I will restore you. Come out of your prison of unbelief, fear, and intimidation, and remember the words in Psalms 33:12, which say, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. All right, everybody, have a great weekend. Stand out. Thank you.